Lucky Luciano is often called the true godfather of the Cosa Nostra. It was his vision that created the New York Mafia families, but very little is known about his wife. Now we know more. In his semi-autobiography, The Last Testament of Lucky Luciano, Lucky gives all of the deeds about his wife and tells us how she ended up. In this video, we are going to be taking you through a journey of what happened to Lucky Luciano's wife. Humble beginnings. Ijea and Lucky first met in a bustling club in Rome while he was in exile in 1947. I first laid my eyes on Ijea Lissoni before the Christmas holidays in 1947. There were many days in my life that were especially important and stayed with me crystal clear, but that was the most important. Intrigued by her beauty and charm, Luciano approached the club owner and expressed his desire to meet the mysterious lady on the dance floor. After the show, the club owner introduced Luciano to Ijea, referring to him as Signor Lucania. However, as their eyes met, Ijea froze, seemingly recognizing Luciano from his notorious reputation. Without uttering a single word, she abruptly left, leaving Luciano perplexed and intrigued. Little did they know that this chance encounter would mark the beginning of a tumultuous and passionate relationship. Undeterred by Ijea's initial reaction, Lucky Luciano was determined to win her over. He enlisted the help of Loretta Massiero, a well-known singer married to Johnny Dorelli a prominent figure in the Italian entertainment industry. Loretta, who happened to be acquainted with Ijea, became Luciano's intermediary in his pursuit of her affections. On a fateful night, Loretta arranged a meeting between Luciano, Ijea, and a group of friends. However, despite Luciano's efforts, Ijea remained aloof, keeping her distance and turning her back on him whenever possible. She kept turning her back on me. Ijea was a girl from a good family and the idea of being seen with a gangster like me was going against everything she had been taught. And I guess most importantly, she was from Milan and I was Sicilian. As far as the Italians were concerned, that meant she was on top of the skyscraper and I was in the basement. Weeks turned into months and Lucky Luciano found himself consumed by thoughts of Ijea Lissoni. All my life up until then I never needed anyone. It was always easy to come and go and there was always another woman, another night. After a few weeks of Ijea playing, hard to get, something that had never happened to me before, I found myself thinking on her all the time. None of the other girls meant anything to me. At first, I thought she was just playing a cute game, but when she continued, I realized she wasn't kidding. Now I don't pretend to know what love, but when I started thinking about her all day, about being with her and doing little things with her, one thing I made sure of, Ijea Lissoni was not a one-night stand. In the beginning of 1948, Luciano's persistence paid off. Ijea agreed to live with him, and they settled into the luxurious Excelsior Hotel. However, Ijea soon requested a change of location, and together they chose an apartment in the prestigious Parioli neighborhood of Rome. This move marked a significant step in their relationship, as they made the decision to share their lives and build a future together. It was a great opportunity for us, Luciano said. That apartment had beautiful American furniture, a new Westinghouse refrigerator with a freezer, an electric stove with an oven, and we even got one of those little infrared grills that had just come out in the px with my connections we had no problems getting things at the px and the american commissary had a lot of good food almost everything we wanted outside rome was a disaster where people had nothing inside that apartment for me it was the happiest time of my life from the moment they met their lives would never be the same again Lucky Luciano and Ijea Lissoni's relationship was anything but conventional. While some claimed they were married in 1949, others believed they only exchanged rings. Regardless, their commitment to each other was undeniable, even as they navigated the complexities of their unconventional love. Despite their deep affection for one another, their relationship was far from perfect. Luciano continued to date other women, and at times, he could be abusive towards Ijea. However, Ijea's love for Luciano was unwavering. She would go to great lengths to find him when he strayed, even threatening him with a gun she kept in her apartment. In the midst of 1949, Luciano found himself incarcerated at Regina Coeli Prison in Rome for a nine-day stint due to his alleged involvement in narcotic smuggling. Despite enduring the discomfort of camping outside the prison and fervently lobbying public officials for his release, he was eventually acquitted due to lack of evidence, even after facing accusations of orchestrating a fire as a means of escape. Upon Luciano's release, a scene of anticipation unfolded as Ijea, accompanied by a throng of reporters and photographers, eagerly awaited him. That afternoon, Italian newspapers overflowed with images capturing the heartfelt embrace between the two. However, both the Italian Ministry of the Interior and the American authorities viewed Luciano as a threat to the state, compelling him to return to his hometown of Lercara Fridi, where he would be subjected to surveillance and a strict curfew. 
Egea stood by his side as they took up residence in the very hotel Luciano had lodged in upon his initial arrival in Italy in 1947. Eventually, they relocated to Villa Egea in Palermo, which would serve as their home for the remainder of 1949 and 1950. In 1951, the couple ventured to Milan to visit Egea's parents, the Lissonis, and their circle of friends. They also embarked on excursions to Paris, where Egea indulged in ballet performances, while Luciano amused himself with trips to the cinema or the racetrack, activities that did not pique Ijea's interest. Luciano humorously remarked, he truly ruffled her feathers when he expressed his willingness to do anything for her, except watch a group of fairies prance about in tights with their assets on display. Ijea remained steadfast in her insistence that Luciano sever ties with his illicit past and forge a path of legality. Consequently, he purchased a farm in Santa Marinella and, with the assistance of a cousin, set it into motion as a legitimate enterprise, thereby honoring his commitment to transition to lawful pursuits, albeit at the cost of leaving his former life behind. Luciano himself later admitted that he wanted to marry Ijea. She was the only woman he had ever loved, and he saw her as his entire life, but circumstances prevented them from formalizing their commitment. They faced societal expectations and the challenges of Luciano's criminal past. I wanted to marry her. She was the only girl I had ever loved in my entire life. In fact, she was my entire life, and she was the only girl I wanted to marry. But as it turned out, we couldn't get married. She wanted to live with me, as if we were husband and wife. She even wore a gold wedding ring. When she started living with me, I wondered what made a good girl like her sleep with a bully like me. The couple also grappled with the idea of having children. Luciano believed that bringing a child into their tumultuous world would only lead to a life of misery. He couldn't bear the thought of subjecting a child to the hardships and dangers that came with his reputation as a gangster. That night was the last time we talked about marriage. He asked me if I wanted to have children and I told him I would like to have 10, but we couldn't afford to have any. What kind of life could it be for one child? From Lucky Luciano, it would be sending the child to a life of misery before he was born, and I couldn't do it. I thought that would tear us apart, but Ijea understood what I meant without a million words of explanation. However, their reality was far from that ideal. Luciano's status as a deportee and the constant surveillance they were under made it impossible for them to live a normal life. They they were confined to their restricted existence always aware of the watchful eyes around them. Luciano's love for Ijea was evident in his desire to protect her from harm. He shielded her from the dangers of his criminal world, keeping her in the dark about the attacks and threats he faced. He wanted to preserve her innocence and shield her from the harsh realities of his life. Their relationship was a constant balancing act, filled with moments of tenderness and turmoil. They lived together as if they were married, despite the absence of a formal ceremony. Their commitment to each other was evident in their unwavering support and dedication. Luciano often described Ijea as the love of his life, the woman who had captured his heart like no other. Despite their chaotic and tumultuous relationship, he adored her and couldn't imagine his life without her by his side. However, their dreams of a life together in New York were shattered when Luciano's appeal to be readmitted to the United States was rejected. Surprisingly, Ijea was relieved by this decision. She believed that returning to the U.S. would only lead Luciano back into a life of crime and trouble. Instead, they focused on building a life together in Naples. Ijea had discussed the idea of buying a house or apartment, envisioning a future where they could create a home of their own. They settled on a penthouse with a breathtaking view of the bay and Vesuvius, a place where they could find solace and create memories. Despite their attempts at establishing successful legal businesses, they faced continuous challenges. Luciano's attention was often diverted elsewhere, and their ventures ultimately faltered. The weight of their circumstances and financial difficulties took a toll on their relationship. Despite the setbacks, Luciano and Ijea found joy in the simple pleasure of life. They dined at renowned restaurants in Naples, savoring the flavors of Italian cuisine. They indulged in weekend getaways to Capri and pampered themselves at health spas, cherishing moments of relaxation and escape. Their love story was marked by its complexities and contradictions. Luciano's problems with Vito Genovese often led him to neglect Igea, causing moments of tension and conflict. However, their bond remained strong, and they continued to navigate the challenges that came their way. Disease and Death at the end of 1957, Lucky Luciano received a message from Dr. Matteoli while Ijea was out pre-Christmas shopping. The doctor informed Luciano about the results of Ijea's complete physical examinations, which had been performed twice in one week. The news was alarming. Ijea needed to undergo an immediate exploratory operation. Lissoni had been experiencing persistent fatigue and pain around small lumps in her left breast. Concerned about her well-being, Luciano took her to Dr. Matteoli 
Hoping for a positive diagnosis, the doctor initially believed that the tumors were not malignant and could be easily removed. However, the challenge they faced was how to break the news to Aegea that she needed surgery. In the following months, Aegea seemed to be symptom-free and her condition appeared to improve. Dr. Mattioli noticed a significant decrease in the lumps during another examination, which gave hope that the operation could be postponed. However, he warned Luciano that frequent examinations were necessary since the situation was not entirely normal. Unfortunately, at the beginning of 1958, the symptoms returned, robbing Egea of her good mood. Luciano took her back to Dr. Mattioli, who suggested removing the lumps. After examining her, the doctor delivered a devastating diagnosis. I think she has cancer. The news hit Luciano like a ton of bricks. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. The doctor explained that Egea had too many symptoms, indicating a high likelihood of cancer. An exploratory operation was necessary to confirm the diagnosis and determine the extent of the disease. Luciano's main concern was saving Ijea's life. He pleaded with Dr. Mattioli to do whatever it took to ensure her survival. The doctor reassured Luciano that if they acted, swiftly there was a chance for Ijea to live a long life. However, if the tumors were indeed cancerous, a more drastic measure might be required, the removal of her chest. With a heavy heart, Luciano made the difficult decision to proceed with the operation. The next day, Ijea was admitted to the hospital, where a pathological test confirmed the presence of carcinoma. Her left breast had to be removed in an extent operation as the cancer had spread deeply. After a few weeks of recovery, Ijea returned to the comfort of their penthouse. However, she couldn't shake off the feeling of depression caused by the removal of her left breast. Luciano, ever the supportive husband, did his best to lift her spirits and provide comfort during this challenging time. News of Ijea's surgery spread, reaching the media and capturing the attention of people across Italy. The public's response was overwhelming, with countless individuals sending flowers as a gesture of support and well wishes. It was a brief moment of joy amidst the turmoil they were facing. Unfortunately, their happiness was short-lived. The symptoms that had plagued Ijea before resurfaced, casting a dark shadow over their lives once again. To their dismay, Ijea discovered more lumps, this time in her right breast. The realization struck her like a bolt of lightning, filling her with fear and uncertainty. The fear of another operation and the possibility of losing her right breast weighed heavily on Ijea's mind. She found solace in their beloved dog, Bambi, who became a constant companion, never leaving her side. Ijea would often hold Bambi close, seeking comfort in their bond during these difficult moments. One of our little dogs was named Bambi. Ijea loved that Walt Disney movie about Bambi, so she named the dog that. She never let him out of her sight. Luciano, understanding the depth of Ijea's fears, embraced her, assuring her that the most important thing was her well-being. He reminded her that their love and support would remain unwavering, regardless of the physical challenges they faced. With heavy hearts, Luciano and Ijea returned to Naples, seeking medical advice once again. Dr. Matteoli, their trusted physician, recommended another operation to remove the lumps in her right breast. However, the situation had taken a turn for the worse. The cancer had already spread, and the doctor delivered devastating news to Luciano. There was nothing more they could do. Dr. Matteoli explained that the disease was spreading rapidly, and the available treatment options were limited. Cobalt therapy, a potential solution, was scarce and unlikely to have a significant impact. The reality of the situation sank in for Luciano. Time was running out for his beloved wife. Luciano's anguish was immeasurable. He couldn't bear the thought of losing Ijea, the woman he cherished. Friends, especially Luciano himself, gathered at their apartment to pray together with Father Scarpato. The pain of witnessing Ijea's agony was unbearable for Luciano, and it deeply affected those around him. In the moments when Ijea's pain was bearable, she urged Luciano not to stay by her side constantly, encouraging him to go out and live his life as usual. Luciano respected her wishes and spent short periods of time away from her, but his thoughts were always consumed by her well-being. Despite the grim prognosis, Ijea had plans for the future. She expressed her desire to see Giovanni Passeggio, a friend, during the summer. Luciano arranged for Passeggio to visit, hoping to bring some joy to Ijea's final days. During their meeting, Ijea shared her wish to be buried in the family plot at the Cimiterio di Musocco in Milan. Luciano made a promise to honor her request, ensuring that her final resting place would be among her loved ones. In September 1958, Ijea's condition took a turn for the worse, and she fell into a coma. Luciano called his father, Giovanni Lissoni, to be by their side during these final moments. Luciano rarely left Ijea's bedside, watching over her attentively for hours on end. The lines on his face deepened with worry, and he couldn't bring himself to eat. Tragically, on September 27, 1958, Igea passed away in Naples, Italy. Just an hour before her death, she briefly regained consciousness, recognizing her father and Luciano. In a poignant moment, she moved her hand slightly towards her father, 
and managed to utter the words, my dear. The loss of Egea was a devastating blow to Luciano. Her body was taken to Milan, where her funeral was held on October 1, 1958. The day was rainy, mirroring the somber mood of the occasion. The funeral procession was a solemn affair with a hearse drawn by eight feathered horses. Luciano, overcome with grief, shed tears as he bid farewell to his beloved wife. Egea's body lay in a beautiful coffin adorned with a gold wedding ring on her finger. A bed of roses, her favorite flower, served as a poignant reminder of her vibrant spirit. Resting on her chest was a silk sash, embroidered with the name Charlie, symbolizing the deep love and connection she shared with Luciano. Egea found her final resting place in the Cimitero Maggiore di Milano, also known as Cimiterio di Musocco, in Milan. Luciano, still grappling with his immense loss, entrusted all of Egea's belongings to his sister, Daria Lissoni. The loss of Egea left lucky Luciano devastated, plunging him into a deep and profound grief. Everyone around him tried to offer support and encouragement, but the pain of losing his beloved wife was something he had to face alone. Luciano found himself in a state of profound loneliness, unable to find solace in the presence of even his closest friends. Chinky Vital, a dear friend of Luciano's, was back in Taormina at the time and offered to come and stay with him for a while. However, Luciano's grief was so overwhelming that nothing seemed to matter, and even the presence of his friends couldn't alleviate the emptiness he felt inside. Luciano wore a black tie and a black ribbon on his lapel, symbols of mourning, as he navigated through the depths of his sorrow. He became uncommunicative, lost in his thoughts and memories of Egea. The pain of her absence was a constant reminder of the void in his life. Eleven weeks after Egea's death, on December 13th, Luciano was forced to re-enter the world. It was a difficult step for him, as he struggled to find meaning and purpose without his beloved wife by his side. The journey of grief was a long and arduous one, but Luciano knew he had to continue living. Despite the supposed love he felt for Egea, Luciano eventually found companionship in another woman. Adriana Rizzo, a woman 39 years younger than him, entered his life in January 1959, just four months after Egea's passing. Their relationship may have raised eyebrows due to the significant age difference, but Luciano saw in Adriana a sense of sincerity and comfort. Adriana understood the depth of Luciano's feelings for Egea, but she seemed genuine and kind-hearted. Luciano felt a sense of ease and compatibility with her, and their relationship developed naturally. Adriana also got along well with Luciano's daughter Lydia, which brought a sense of peace to their dynamic. It is important to note that Luciano's relationship with Adriana did not diminish the love and memories he held for Egea. She remained a significant presence in his heart, and he cherished the time they had spent together. Luciano's connection with Adriana was a way for him to find solace and companionship as he navigated through the complexities of grief. Lucky Luciano's life of crime. But the death of his wife did not deter Lucky from living a life of crime. Born in 1897 in Lercara, Fridi, Sicily, Luciano immigrated to the United States with his family at a young age. Settling in New York City, he quickly became entangled in the criminal underworld that thrived during the era of Prohibition. As the sale, production, and distribution of alcohol became illegal in the 1920s, a lucrative black market for alcohol emerged. Luciano, along with his associates, saw this as a golden opportunity to amass wealth and power. They established a vast network of speakeasies, secret bars where alcohol was served illegally, and worked tirelessly to smuggle alcohol into the country. Luciano's bootlegging operations were not limited to just smuggling alcohol. He also controlled the production and distribution of counterfeit alcohol, often referred to as rot gut. This low-quality, sometimes dangerous alcohol was sold to unsuspecting customers, further increasing Luciano's profits. To protect his bootlegging empire, Luciano formed alliances with other prominent gangsters of the time, such as Meyer Lansky and Frank Costello. Together, they formed a powerful syndicate known as the Big Seven which dominated the illegal alcohol trade in New York City. Luciano's bootlegging operations were not without their fair share of violence and bloodshed. Rival gangs constantly vied for control of the lucrative bootlegging territories, leading to brutal turf wars. Luciano, known for his strategic thinking and ruthless nature, was not afraid to eliminate his rivals to maintain his dominance. One of the most infamous incidents associated with Luciano's bootlegging activities was the 1929 St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Allegedly orchestrated by his rival, Al Capone, the massacre resulted in the deaths of seven members of a rival gang. 
While Luciano was not directly involved in the incident, it highlighted the brutal nature of the bootlegging underworld. Despite the constant threat of law enforcement, Luciano managed to evade capture for his bootlegging activities. He employed various tactics, such as bribing police officers and politicians, to ensure his operations remained undisturbed. Luciano's ability to navigate the complex web of corruption within the city made him a formidable force in the world of organized crime. As the Prohibition era came to an end in 1933, Luciano's bootlegging empire faced new challenges. With the legalization of alcohol, the demand for illegal alcohol diminished, forcing Luciano to adapt his criminal activities. This marked a turning point in his criminal career, as he shifted his focus towards other illicit ventures, such as gambling and narcotics. After the end of Prohibition, Luciano shifted his focus towards expanding his criminal empire and solidifying his dominance over the underworld. Luciano recognized the importance of unity among criminal organizations and sought to establish a centralized power structure. In 1931, he orchestrated the infamous meeting of the top crime bosses in the United States, known as the Atlantic City Conference. This gathering aimed to resolve disputes, establish territories, and create a framework for cooperation among the various criminal factions. At the conference, Luciano proposed the formation of a national crime syndicate, also known as the Commission. This commission would consist of representatives from different criminal families and would serve as a governing body to resolve conflicts and maintain order within the underworld. Luciano's vision for a unified criminal organization was a revolutionary concept that would shape the future of organized crime. Under Luciano's leadership, the commission became a powerful force in the criminal underworld. He exerted his influence to ensure that all major decisions were made collectively, avoiding unnecessary conflicts and bloodshed. This centralized control allowed Luciano to expand his criminal activities beyond bootlegging and into other lucrative ventures, such as gambling, labor racketeering, and prostitution. Luciano's control over organized crime extended beyond the United States. He established strong ties with criminal organizations in Italy, forging alliances with Sicilian mafia families. This international network allowed him to expand his reach and influence, solidifying his position as a global crime boss. One of Luciano's most notable achievements was his reorganization of the Italian-American Mafia, also known as La Cosa Nostra. He implemented a hierarchical structure, with himself at the top as the boss of bosses. This structure ensured a clear chain of command and facilitated efficient communication and coordination among the various families. Luciano's ruthless control over organized crime was evident in his handling of internal disputes. He was known for his swift and decisive action against against those who posed a threat to his power. Luciano ordered the assassination of several high-ranking members of rival factions, eliminating potential rivals and consolidating his control. However, Luciano's reign over organized crime was not without its challenges. In 1936, he was arrested on charges of compulsory prostitution and sentenced to 30 to 50 years in prison. Despite his incarceration, Luciano continued to exert influence over the criminal underworld through his trusted associates, such as Frank Costello. While in prison, Luciano played a crucial role in aiding the United States government during World War II. His extensive connections in the shipping industry allowed him to provide valuable intelligence and assistance in securing the New York waterfront against potential sabotage. In return for his cooperation, Luciano's sentence was committed muted, and he was deported to Italy in 1946. One of Luciano's key tactics was his skillful use of bribery and corruption. He understood the importance of having influential allies within the legal system and exploited this to his advantage. Luciano would often bribe police officers, politicians, and even judges to turn a blind eye to his criminal activities. This network of corrupt officials provided him with protection and allowed him to operate with relative impunity. Luciano's connections extended beyond the local level. He had powerful allies in high-ranking positions within the federal government, including the FBI. These relationships provided him with valuable information about ongoing investigations and allowed him to stay one step ahead of the law. To further complicate matters for law enforcement, Luciano employed a strategy of compartmentalization. He ensured that his criminal activities were divided among different individuals and organizations, making it difficult for investigators to connect the dots and build a solid case against him. This decentralized structure also minimized the risk of one person betraying the entire operation. Luciano was also known for his meticulous attention to detail. He would carefully plan his criminal activities, leaving no room for error. He would study the patterns and routines of 
of law enforcement, identifying weaknesses and vulnerabilities that he could exploit. This level of preparation and foresight allowed him to execute his operations smoothly and avoid detection. Another tactic employed by Luciano was his ability to maintain a low profile. Unlike other high-profile gangsters of the time, Luciano preferred to operate discreetly, avoiding unnecessary attention. He understood that drawing too much public scrutiny would only increase the chances of law enforcement closing in on him. By keeping a low profile, he was able to continue his criminal activities without arousing suspicion. Luciano's cunning extended to his ability to manipulate public perception. He carefully cultivated an image of a respectable businessman, often seen in expensive suits and mingling with influential figures in society. This facade allowed him to blend in with the upper echelons of society, making it even more challenging for law enforcement to connect him to his criminal activities. In addition to his mastery of evasion tactics, Luciano was also a master of disguise. He would frequently change his appearance using wigs, fake mustaches, and other disguises to avoid detection. This chameleon-like ability to transform himself made it incredibly difficult for law enforcement to track his movements. Despite the best efforts of law enforcement, lucky Luciano remained one step ahead. His cunning, strategic thinking, and ability to evade the law allowed him to continue his criminal activities for years. It was not until his arrest in 19 36 on charges of compulsory prostitution that he faced any significant consequences. Even then, his influence and connections continued to shape the criminal underworld from behind bars. That brings us to the end of this video. For more videos like this, click on the cards on your screen.